on this Monday night. What is making Canadian diplomats in Cuba and their families so sick? Experts are baffled and say it's a brain injury that's new to science. So the government is sending the diplomats' spouses and children home. Tonight, what we know about this medical mystery. Also, a CBC News exclusive reveals how some team owners are making money off of scalped tickets. And take a look at this. These are buckets on the field at Rogers Centre in Toronto, catching water after chunks of ice fell off the CN Tower and ripped right through the dome. We'll show you the damage from that spring ice storm. This is The National. When you think about dangerous diplomatic missions, you might picture a war zone, not a country where more than a million Canadians vacation every year. But tonight, Ottawa has declared Cuba too risky for the families of our diplomats, all because of an illness with no apparent cause and no clear cure. About a year ago, diplomats serving here in Havana and their families began complaining of some rather strange symptoms. At least 10 Canadians have shown unexplained dizziness, headaches, nausea, even some hearing loss. And now the government says the Canadians may have a brain injury. Catherine Cullen's been tracking this story today from Ottawa. Catherine, tell us what we know about why these Canadians have become ill. Well, frankly, Rosemary, in some ways, this story is more mysterious than ever now. And that's despite the fact that Canadian and American officials have been looking into this for about a year. Now, a senior Canadian official did say today that those up to 10 people who have been experiencing these syndromes, they've come back to Canada. In some cases, their symptoms were getting better. But in some cases, their symptoms have actually come back once again. And so we find ourselves with this medical enigma of sorts. Some people are calling it Havana syndrome. Just listen to an American doctor who examined some American diplomats who fell ill. So this is, this is kind of like, um, you know, immaculate concussion. You know, we don't know what happened. And yet they look almost exactly like the patients we would see in a concussion clinic. Canadian officials said today that two causes are now thought to be improbable. This wasn't a sonic attack and it wasn't a mass psychogenic illness, basically a sort of hysteria with no physical cause. Officials also said today that they've done environmental testing for the diplomatic residences of embassy staff and that didn't lead to a cause. Instead, Global Affairs Canada says medical information points to a new type of possible acquired brain injury. Department officials are calling for more research, noting the cause remains unknown, but could be human-made. And listen to what the American expert had to say about that. Is this the first time you're, you're, you have to deal with something like that? I think it's the first time anybody's had to deal with this. In the medical history? Yeah, there really is nothing like this. I mean, you know, so now, to be clear, uh, Canadian officials are not blaming anyone for this. It's not clear if an individual or several people are really responsible for all this. We still have so many questions. They have said, though, that Cuban officials have been very helpful. They've been cooperative during the investigations, Rosemary. Okay, as I mentioned off the top, so many Canadians go down to Cuba for holidays. Should tourists, should other Canadians be worried about this? Well, Global Affairs Canada says no. They say that when you look at what's happened here, there really was just this cluster of incidents affecting Canadian and American diplomats and their families. They do not believe that there is an added, uh, an increased level of threat to Canadian tourists. They do say, though, that while they continue to investigate this, they continue to have hope. They really are not any closer to figuring out exactly what has happened here. Such a strange story. Oh. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate it. CBC's Catherine Cullen in Ottawa tonight. Unaccompanied posts are considered so dangerous that diplomats can't take their family members. Typically, that title is given to conflict zones, but with Havana now on that list, that means the Canadian Foreign Service considers Cuba as dangerous as the missions in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and South Sudan. As Catherine mentioned, it's not just Canadians that have fallen sick. The mysterious illness is stumping U.S. authorities as well. Well, you're going to see what's happening in Cuba, but some bad, they did some bad things in Cuba. At least 22 Americans got sick in what the U.S. says were attacks on its diplomats. For his part, Donald Trump says Cuba is responsible, but he's offered no evidence. No one else has either. The U.S. has pulled uh, more than half of its staff home, even telling Americans to reconsider traveling there. 
Now to an investigation closer to home. Alleged serial killer Bruce MacArthur has one more life to answer for when he eventually goes on trial. Tonight, he is charged with an eighth count of first-degree murder. And there's something about this newest victim that sets him apart from all the rest. Joanna Rumiliotis has our story. To police, he was a mystery, a man in a picture with no name. Until now, it's a shred of dignity in a horror story that keeps unfolding. I can now report that the remains have been identified as Kirushna Kumar Kanagaratnam. Kanagaratnam is now Bruce MacArthur's eighth alleged victim, killed, police believe, in late 2015, identified only after police released a picture of him dead on two occasions. The stress and anxiety over dealing with hundreds of tips, hundreds of missing person occurrences, and dozens of potential identifications for the eighth victim, eighth victim has been enormous. Like some other alleged victims of MacArthur's, Kanagaratnam's remains were found in planters at a home where MacArthur stored his landscaping tools. But there's a chilling randomness to his murder. Unlike the others, police haven't connected him to Toronto's gay village or found an online profile on any dating apps linked to MacArthur. He doesn't quite fit the profile that we've seen before. This does create basically a wide open net. What is clear, his story is a sad one. Police say Kanagaratnam arrived in Canada in 2010 from Sri Lanka. CBC News has learned he was on the MV Sunsea, a Thai cargo ship carrying nearly 500 Tamil asylum seekers that docked in British Columbia. Most were fleeing the aftermath of Sri Lanka's bloody civil war to survive an arduous 100-day journey at sea, only to be murdered in the safe haven Canada represented, is a cruel twist of fate. Gabriel Chand was one of the lawyers involved in the refugee hearings. He met Kanagaratnam and remembers a soft-spoken man. It was shocking to me. You know, he was such a nice guy. Um, and just to, to know that that's, that was his fate, it was, it was terrible. This man spent all that time at sea with Kanagaratnam. He doesn't want us to use his full name. They both spoke of creating new lives in Canada. Both ended up in Toronto and would run into each other over the years. He says Kanagaratnam became despondent after his refugee claim was denied. At one point, was living on the streets. Only we, he came to Canada to protect his life, but unfortunately he's not with us now. It's really bad news. Joanna is here with more on this case. Uh, it's nothing short of a miracle that both those men made it here uh, alive. It, all the more horrible what happened. Anything more you can tell us about him in particular? There's a lot of sensitivities uh, regarding his case in particular because police were very clear not to speculate about his sexual orientation and later told us on background they're being deliberately careful because of the repercussions for his family back home in Sri Lanka where it's, it's a crime to be gay. So those are the kind of sensitivities they're dealing with in this case and in other cases where they're still receiving calls from people who had very scary encounters with Bruce MacArthur who also come from countries that are quite conservative in values and they are also not going public because of those same concerns. Oh, makes it so much harder. What is the status of the investigation? Now? At this point, there's one more alleged victim whose remains have yet to be identified. And at this point, there's no other sets of remains in those planters, but they're still going through them. So that's the news that we'll be expecting to hear hopefully soon. Okay, Joanna, thanks very much. You're welcome. The eight alleged victims of Bruce MacArthur went missing over a period of less than seven years, and all but two were born outside of Canada. Skanda Navaratnam was a refugee from Sri Lanka. He was last seen leaving a gay nightclub in September of 2010. Abdul Basir Faizi was from Afghanistan. His last known whereabouts, Toronto's gay village in December 2010. Majid Kehan, also from Afghanistan, was last seen in October of 2012. Sarush Mahmoudi, who came from Iran, was reported missing by his family in 2015. And as you heard, Karushna Kumar Kanagaratnam came from Sri Lanka. Police believe he died in late 2015. Canadian-born Dean Lissowick had no fixed address and was never reported missing, but we know he stayed at a shelter in 2016. Salim Essen, born in Turkey, was last seen near his downtown Toronto home in April 2017. Andrew Kinsman, the only other victim born in Canada, was last seen in June of 2017 the day after that year's Pride Parade. Here's what else we're following on The National tonight. Donald Trump's personal lawyer 
and the porn star he allegedly paid off were both in court today. Keith Bogue takes us through what we learned. Patrick Chan announces his retirement. The Olympic medalist talks with Ian about settling for silver in Sochi and what's next for his career. But first, an emotional tribute in Saskatoon to a teammate, friend and son killed in the humble bus crash. Family and friends say Evan Thomas loved craft dinner, had a knack for science and wanted to go into medicine so he could help others. Instead, thousands gathered at the SaskTel Centre today to say their final goodbyes. Susan Ormiston was there. They called him E.T. for Evan Thomas, just 18. Looking forward to those final playoff games, which never came. His surviving Broncos teammates came to the SaskTel Centre, another memorial out of so many. Those who could make it, Grayson Cameron and Derek Patter, got hospital day passes struggling just to be here, with many other teammates still too fragile. Braden Camrud was close to Evan. He was on the bus that night. We formed great friendships and bonded over a lot of things, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss him dearly. He was, uh, he was an incredible person. Camrud has been to too many teammates' funerals. I've been to every single one so far, and you know, it's not getting any easier. It's, I'm, I'm dealing with it okay. It's, it's just hard, you know, to see and to even picture a family, you know, spending the rest of their days with, you know, without their son. It's so hard seeing the other families in the, in the condition that they're in, but I'm here for every single one of them. I'm here for all my teammates, and the thing that's getting me by is just, you know, spending time with them and, you know, being able to, you know, give my teammates a hug and give my family members a hug. This was the Thomas's family farewell to their only son, but thousands more were here as a tribute, really, to all the 16 players and staff lost and the 13 others injured. Only one other memorial has ever been held here for Gordie Howe. And this first public memorial was deeply personal, too, in pre-recorded tributes like from Evan's sister, Jordan. I still have the feeling that you're just a Snapchat away, or a short call away, or even just a short drive away. You are my person, the one I could turn to for anything I needed. Scott Thomas, Evan's father, has been a rock and was again today. On Friday, April 6th, 2018, at approximately 5 p.m., 15 souls were released from their bodies and exploded across the landscape at record speed. Speaking to the wounds left for so many. It's randomness and it's senselessness. It has been simply unfair. There are more funerals to come. A steady march of grief, which although necessary, has been relentless. What helps you the most right now? Not, not thinking about it. You know, it, it still doesn't seem real. I'm, you know, um, a few days ago, I went to text one of my buddies who actually isn't here with us anymore, and you know, I kind of, I kind of forgot about it, and, and then it kind of hit me again. So I'm just, I'm just trying to spend as much time with my family as possible. They're, they really helped me through this. As he is helping other Broncos families keep their boys' spirits alive. Heaven, my wonderful boy, rest in peace. I love you, Dad. So there is an incredible bond between families who've lost their loved ones and families of surviving Broncos. It may seem difficult, but they are all going through these memorials and funerals together. We believe that two of the players are dealing with partial paralysis. We're told by the hospital that 10 players are still here officially, two of them in critical condition. And we're hearing from parents that, of course, the path to recovery is not a straight line at all, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Susan Ormiston in Saskatoon for us tonight. We do have one more note on this story. The online fundraiser for the Broncos, the one that's raised millions of dollars, it's now over 12 million. And today we learned what the team plans to do with that money. If there's any light shining through this dark time, it has come in the form of love for one another. Love and care and compassion is stronger now, I believe, in our world than it has ever been. And our families and our entire Broncos organization has been blessed to feel this love from people from around the globe. So the Broncos say the GoFundMe campaign will stay open for two more days, then an advisory committee will get to work on deciding how exactly that money should be spent. 
Beyond that, a new foundation is being set up to raise further funds for those affected by the crash. Now to the latest CBC News Toronto Star investigation. As anyone watching the Leafs game tonight knows, tickets are expensive and so hard to come by. We've now learned the team owners have identified the scalpers preying on tickets, but as Dave Seglins explains, instead of revoking those tickets, the team owners are just cashing in. The Leafs' first home playoff game, the most expensive ticket in the country. $700 for two tickets. $417. Isn't that insane? For two tickets, I paid $1,100. Too steep for many who simply can't afford to go. Welcome to the Leaf Geeks podcast. This is Ian here as always. This super fan who hosts a weekly show on all things hockey says, due to the prices, he's never been to a playoff game. It's unfortunate. Like, it just sucks. There's no other way around it. I want to go, but I can't afford to. Even more frustrating, news the Leafs owners are making deals with scalpers. It's, I mean, to, to fans like me, it's, it, it feels like a big middle finger. Zach Hyman flying towards the net, cuts in, he scores! Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment also owns the Raptors, and for both, they've identified thousands of season tickets hoarded and resold by scalpers, or as some prefer, professional brokers. So, Mark, I've sold these four tickets, so can you take them off inventory? I've been called a scalper for 40 years. I'm okay with it. I got over it a long time ago. My customers have never had a problem with what I do. They're happy. But they he's just had a rude shock. A few weeks ago, Maple Leaf Sports unexpectedly jacked the prices for known resellers. For Leafs to renew season tickets, a regular pair, Reds, pretty good seats, about 15000 for commercial resellers, it's 20000 And the best seats in the house, Platinums. Regular season tickets, $21,960. The scalper price, almost 29000 A 30% hit. Now all of a sudden the team looks like they're going to take off and could take off for a decade. It's, it's, it's opportunism. This price hike sounds like it could be good for fans. The MLSE trying to price out the scalpers. But there's more to it. The team actually invited them to join a special trusted reseller program, which brokers fear could give owners yet another cut. We're being targeted. They basically want a piece of our action, really what it comes down to. Not a lot of sympathy from our super fan. If they can identify who the scalpers are and who's not actually using the tickets to go to the games, who's just reselling them every single time, I'd, I'd like to see them taken off the season ticket holder list. That, I think that would be a good start. MLSE says each team has its own way of dealing with scalpers. And for them, charging more is appropriate. As for that formal reseller program, following questions from CBC, they've scrapped it for now. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. So as you heard Dave say just now, not all teams treat scalpers the same way. In Winnipeg, the Jets have a totally different approach. It has been our practice to cancel broker tickets, and it, take, it takes a while to weed through. Uh, and determine who exactly is doing it, but it's absolutely our preference that tickets for the Winnipeg Jets remain in the hands of Winnipeg Jets fans. So the Jets require season ticket holders to sign a contract prohibiting commercial sales. They're also required to pay a hefty security deposit, and if they're caught reselling, those season ticket holders can kiss their deposit and tickets goodbye. Now here's a look at downtown Toronto, still dealing with the aftermath of an ice storm. Huge chunks of ice have been falling off the CN Tower, which means tonight it is closed and so is the area around it. One of those chunks ripped a hole into the roof of the Rogers Centre below. Crews have been trying to close the hole back up and on the field they set up tarps and buckets to catch the water. But the Blue Jays game against the Kansas City Royals did end up being postponed. In the Ottawa area, people woke up to a city coated in a layer of ice. On Parliament Hill, falling ice shattered windows in center block. And in parts of southwestern Ontario, the problem isn't ice, but severe flooding. The damage in Leamington, so bad, the worst in decades apparently, 1,500 homes were surrounded by water, and because of high winds, a flood warning is still in place. 
April showers bring May flowers, I guess. <laughs> a lot more ahead tonight on The National. A bombshell from Donald Trump's personal attorney. We'll tell you what Michael Cohen said inside a Manhattan courtroom. And another blow tonight of the fight over the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Alberta is now threatening to cut off oil and gas to British Columbia. And in tonight's national documentary, Paul Hunter takes us inside the race to Mars. Meet a group of people already simulating life on the red planet. My worst moment was probably being stuck in the airlock with um, a lot of poo. A reality show style showdown today in a New York court. Donald Trump's longtime personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, fighting over evidence seized in an FBI raid as porn star Stormy Daniels, who claims she was paid to keep quiet about her affair with Trump, looked on. The judge rejected Cohen's bid to block prosecutors from reviewing the documents, but as Keith Bogue tells us, it was another revelation entirely which stole the show. At the start of the day, Michael Avenatti, lawyer for the adult film actress Stormy Daniels, ridiculed Donald Trump's lawyer Michael Cohen for representing himself in his case against the Department of Justice. You know, there's an old saying that any attorney that represents himself has a fool for a client. I think there would, that would certainly be true in this instance, no doubt. It was Cohen who insisted this case be heard, and so by extension, it was Cohen who accidentally caused the revelation of a juicy secret. Besides the president and another Republican who's paid for the silence of a Playboy bunny, Cohen has another client, Fox News host Sean Hannity, which made for an awkward moment. Of course, for us, the elephant in the room at the moment is that Sean Hannity is said to have, according to court documents, been a third client of Michael Cohen. Hannity has never disclosed the fact that Cohen was his lawyer, even though he's often slammed the special counsel, Robert Mueller, and the FBI for their roles in raiding Cohen's office. Robert Mueller is now officially gone rogue and declared war against the president. On his radio show, Hannity tried to deny that Cohen was his lawyer. I never paid legal fees to Michael. Cohen is just someone he talks to about legal stuff, he said. I have occasionally had brief discussions with him about legal questions. But he thought those discussions were attorney-client confidential. Which means he thought Cohen was his lawyer after all. I said last Friday and this weekend that Michael Cohen was radioactive. What we witnessed earlier in the hearing with the disclosure relating to Sean Hannity proved my point. And of course, the adult film actress who says Trump is trying to shut her up about their affair continues to demand her right to speak. And I give my word that we will not rest until that happens. A prospect that will delight some, but quite possibly terrify others. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Washington. And ahead tonight on The National, he's a fan favorite and one of Canada's most decorated skaters. Patrick Chan is calling it a career. And Ian caught up with him to talk about inspiring the next generation. But first, what drives someone to voluntarily live in isolation as if they are millions of kilometers away from the rest of humanity? Next, Paul Hunter takes us inside a simulation preparing for life on Mars. What I miss most about my life back on Earth is my fiance. I miss all of those little moments during the day that you have together. If you ask the people over at NASA, when will humans set foot on Mars, they will tell you that journey is well underway. Forget about orbiters and rovers. People are already experiencing life on the red planet, sort of. On tonight's national documentary, Paul Hunter takes us inside a mock Mars mission. The landscape itself is, without a doubt, otherworldly. Barren, rocky. Mars, at least for now, remains a place untouched by humans. But, just so you know, this isn't Mars. Those tiny yellow specks on the hilltop, those are humans. 
and this is Hawaii, on the shoulder of an active volcano. Those humans are volunteers who've departed Earth, sort of. What I miss most about my life back on Earth is my fiance. I miss all of those little moments during the day that you have together. So we're here at a mock Mars simulation. I think I can speak for everybody that we all would go to Mars. You know, we're living the astronaut life here. Six people who last year agreed to live together like this for eight months as if they were actually in a habitat on faraway Mars. And as it would be if they were on Mars, all of the video was taken by those at the habitat for CBC News. Bye, Bye. CBC. I love you. All communications, our interviews, even emails are on a lengthy time delay. So the whole thing is an exercise in kind of uh, patience and humility and uh, doing your best to find out what parts of you you need to pull out and amplify and what parts you need to uh, pull back a little bit so that you can be the best crew member, uh, teammate for the rest of your crew members. The experiment is funded by NASA as it considers an actual mission to the planet, one of near countless projects underway with that goal. So they grow their own food, just like in the movies and they conduct science experiments just like they would on Mars. But the key aspect is testing interactions and behaviors under stress because in theory, they're millions of kilometers from anyone else. Supplies are sent in periodically, but otherwise they're on their own. Oh, that's so horrible. No matter the challenges, big or small. My worst moment, <laughs> was probably being stuck in the airlock with um, a lot of poo. And forget about feeling the sun or a cool breeze. Every time they go outside, they have to suit up for real. It's hard slogging. But one conclusion they've all reached is that getting to Mars is 100% achievable. It's definitely not a pipe dream. It sounds like a lot, but I think we'll get there eventually in very little bit of time. The pieces are out on the table. It's putting that puzzle together. That will happen relatively soon, I believe. I think that technically we can absolutely go in my lifetime. I think that we could go, we could start working now if we needed to. Like it's a matter of how much risk are you willing to accept for the people who go. And this is where it's like feeling sitting outside, just looking at the rocks and being like, you know what, it really does feel like Mars. Martha Lenio, now back at her home in Waterloo, Ontario, lived in that habitat on an earlier eight-month mission. How did you not go stir-crazy? <laughs> Having very good crewmates. <laughs> she emphasizes that as engineers work on the technical challenges of getting to Mars, it's equally important to sort out the psychological ones. The goal is to figure out how you pick a crew and support a crew for these long duration isolated space missions so that they won't, people won't go crazy and kill each other because you're gonna be confined in a small space with five other people for up to three years. Um, so that does take a fair bit of social ability. And so they're studying you, basically? Yeah, yeah we're the guinea pigs in a psychology experiment. Viking Lander 1 has safely landed on the surface. It's not like there isn't already stuff on Mars. NASA's Viking Explorer got there in the 1970s and sent back these images. Other robotic missions have followed. These images, each of them stunning, were taken not long ago by NASA's latest Mars rover, the Curiosity. But getting people to Mars and then home safely to Earth is a whole other matter. So, thousands of kilometers from that habitat in Hawaii at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, NASA engineers whose job it is to think the unthinkable and who are busy on all kinds of things these days include Mars on their interplanetary to-do list. We're an electric spacecraft, right? So we have solar arrays on the service module. That's a mock-up of a space capsule called Orion. 
Najud Maranci leads its development and gave us a peek inside. It's about the size of two minivans and when it's finished is meant to get astronauts out beyond Earth's orbit for the first time since the days of Apollo, taking the first step toward Mars. But that's the easy part. Challenges in deep space loom. Radiation, illnesses, fuel, just one chance at a safe landing, and then the rest of it. You're going to need a big habitat. We're going to need big solar cells, systems, power, food, water, all those things. And then you're going to need a rocket to get them back off the surface of Mars. So all of that has to be there even before the crew arrives because you can't have it show up later. And remember that time delay communicating with Earth? So that means if I told you there's an emergency on the spaceship, the ground team would not know that it's happening until 12 minutes later. And if they had an instruction to send back, it'd be another 12 minutes to get back. If there's a fire, if there's a leak, all of those things have to be dealt with by the crew independently, which is a, a, certainly a challenge we haven't faced in any human space flight so far. And there's been a lot of challenges, but the ground's able to assist. It sounds daunting. It is. But NASA's gigantic complex in Houston is littered with evidence it's managed daunting challenges before. That's a Saturn V at an on-site museum, the kind of rocket they once used for that other dream, getting to the moon. Meanwhile, just down the street a ways, more evidence NASA's now looking much further afield. We're told to please keep our voices quiet. And these are, that's what's going on behind us right now. These are the people in there, right? Yes, that's correct. We have surveillance cameras inside the habitat. Another habitat with more volunteers inside, this time as if in a spaceship flying toward an asteroid, the kind of trip that might one day target Mars. We had a tour of the simulated mission control with NASA's Andy Self. The thing about this is, unlike a normal mission control here, they are actually right there. Yes. I mean, that's how close yes. we are. That's, yes. that's them, right? We're about 30 feet away. Yeah. Wow. For this test, the volunteers are inside with no windows, just cameras and each other, ostensibly en route and isolated for 45 days. Can we get a status? NASA experts watch how they get along. Unlike the habitat in Hawaii, for those simply flying through space, there's much less to occupy the time. So their study, to see how pure monotony might affect their thinking and actions. It's basically looking at human nature, seeing how it may unfold, and then countermeasuring it to ensure that it doesn't pose a risk to the mission. And then there's the biggest challenge of all, money. On that, NASA's been busy with traveling exhibits, promoting even the idea of spending the billions of dollars such a trip would cost. Check this theoretical Mars vehicle, a crowd pleaser, aimed at winning the hearts and minds of, yep, taxpayers, and their kids. You guys could be the first ones on Mars. How cool is that? Public support is crucial. Meanwhile, private companies now play a key role as well. SpaceX, owned by billionaire Elon Musk, famously is now a mega player in the push toward Mars, and Musk himself a mega promoter. What I really want to try to uh, achieve here is to make Mars seem possible. Uh, make it seem as though it's something that we can do in our lifetimes um, and that you can go. In other words, he says, dream big. Working alongside NASA, SpaceX hopes to get to Mars by the middle of the next decade. This is just seated. So what to make of all of this? Who better to ask than someone who theoretically could go? Canada's David Saint-Jacques prepping for his imminent trip to the space station, he thinks about this stuff a lot and bottom lines it this way. Yes, it's risky, it will always be. Space flight is maybe the most dangerous thing humans have ever done. But we have learned a lot in the process and that makes it worth it. So eventually we will go to Mars when that risk balance kind of makes sense. 
This is NASA, we make it possible, right? And I'm an engineer and that's my job is to solve problems. So I think these are all things we can do. It's not easy and we need a lot of people working on it to make it happen, but I certainly think it's possible. These are within the realm of human capability in my opinion. Meanwhile, they keep at it, finessing Orion, getting it ship shape, balancing those risks while considering all the other challenges. Will there be the money for it? Says St. Jacques, there are many important earthly priorities, but... The priority, of course, should never be space exploration. There's other things that are more important right now. We should always, always keep a little sliver of the pie for blue sky research, for the arts, for exploration, because that is how we progress. So eventually, it will become reasonable and natural to take a deep breath and dive and make the trip. And so, as that Hawaiian experiment continues, now with a new crew out exploring make-believe Mars, they take those deep breaths and they dream. After all, what a trip it would be. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Earth. <laughs> well, that is fascinating, and I think daunting was probably the right word there. <laughs> okay, up next on The National, Patrick Chan on his decision to retire from competition and what he learned when his Olympic dream didn't come true. A lot of people looked at Sochi, they agonized, you ended up getting the silver. Yeah, yeah. You could have had gold. Yeah, very close. <laughs> yeah. Was, was that, tell me about the process after. Sure, in terms sure. Of coming so um, close. I couldn't, I couldn't really understand what happened in Sochi until maybe two years ago. Before we head to break, we told you last month that the National Gallery of Canada is selling that, a uh, Marc Chagall masterpiece. So it can buy an important work of Canadian national heritage after lots of pressure and questions. Today, the gallery revealed what it is. It is Jacques-Louis David's neoclassical painting, Saint Jerome Hears the Trumpet of the Last Judgment. The painting came to Canada in the late 1800s and it's currently for sale by the Notre Dame Cathedral Basilica in Quebec City. The National Gallery says it wanted to buy Saint Jerome to make sure it stayed in Canada. Chagall's The Eiffel Tower will be auctioned off next month, a decision it says it didn't take lightly. The painting expected to sell for as much as nine million dollars US. Seeing my parents smiling in the stands and cheering loud at my last Olympic Games was my golden ticket. They were there before I dreamed of winning, and they're still here at the end. Patrick Chan, one of Canada's most decorated figure skaters, announced his retirement today after 12 years of competition. He has a proud career to look back on, and at age 27, he still has a lot to look forward to. Ian Hennemansing recently spoke with Chan about his future and also how he dealt with the pressure of high-stakes competition. Here's that interview and some background. I wasn't born to do tennis. I wasn't born to do golf. You know, I was given a body to, to do quads and to jump and skate the way I skate. Patrick Chan has been skating since he was just a kid. His talent, unmistakable. At just 17, he became the youngest men's champion in Canadian history. A teenage titan who has arrived. He is a three-time world figure skating champion and made his Olympic debut in Vancouver where he stood out. For the next three years, Chan dominated. He's looking to become the first Canadian man ever to win an Olympic title. He was a favorite for gold at Sochi, but a shaky performance dashed that dream. He settled for silver. In need of a fresh start, Chan changed coaches and moved to Vancouver. He hoped for one last shot of glory at Pyeongchang. He won gold in the team event, but finished ninth in his final individual performance. Now Chan is moving on to the next chapter of his life, which includes coaching and skating and exhibitions. He leaves as one of Canada's greatest figure skaters. I met up with him a few days ago in Vancouver to talk about his remarkable career and what comes next. So now that you're retired, 
no one's going to tell you what to eat, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to be thinking about how many quads you're going to be doing in three months' time. Exactly. Uh, that must feel kind of liberating. It is. Um, and, and I get best of both worlds. I, I love jumping, but not as much as I love skating and just feeling the ice, feeling the, the glide, feeling the interaction that I can have with a, an audience um, without the pressure of landing the big jumps. And that's exactly what I get to do. Stars on Ice in May, going across Canada, 12 cities. It's awesome. I don't even need to promote was it. Was that a plug? Was that, did you no, just go I don't even need to promote it. It's, it's doing so great. I'm with my favorite, some of my favorite friends on this yeah. tour. Um, and we're such talented people that are happy. And going through this post-competition process together, mm -hmm. Tessa and Scott, Eric and Megan, it's, it's a, a very good situation to be in for me. Can I ask you about Sochi? I mean, you, yeah. you, you, you're such a fantastic skater. You've been the best in the world multiple times. Mm -hmm. Most of us will never be able to say that about what we do. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people looked at Sochi, they agonized. You ended up getting the silver. Yeah, yeah. You could have had gold. Yeah, very close. <laughs> yeah. Was, was that, tell me about the process after. Sure, in terms sure. Of coming so um, close. I couldn't, I couldn't really understand what happened in Sochi until maybe two years ago, um, 2014. Oh, sorry, 2017, 2018 season, and um, it's the irony is, is that if I knew what I kn knew now and the way I trained leading into Pyeongchang back in 2014 and just replace it, and life is like that, um, I probably would have won gold. But we can always play these mind tricks on ourselves and these scenarios and these dreams. But I'm as happy as I would have been, I, w I am as I would be if I. Um, won gold in Sochi and who knows maybe I wouldn't have had that amazing experience of winning team gold in Korea because I might have hung them up then so there's so many um, exciting scenarios you can play with your mind but I wouldn't trade for how everything turned out um, all the way till now. Realistically I mean it worked out so well for you but realistically when you think of those young Patrick Chans mm -hmm. and, and, and women as well young women across the country and cities small towns who have this dream mm -hmm. to skate in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty slim chance you're going to make it that far. Especially now. <laughs> yeah. And lots of hours they would have yeah. to put in. What, what, would, what advice would you give them? So we're living in a, in a time where figure skating is now... Um, at 13, 14 years old, you need, to, you need to be landing jumps that I was landing when I was 19, 18. So my message to, to parents and to the younger skaters is to please enjoy the process of learning how to skate. Can, Skating is in our blood as Canadians, and I think it's not just a sport that you're learning about culture. And um, I, I, I just think, please take your time and uh, learn how to skate and, in, and enjoy it before it gets too competitive and too crazy. I was sort of distracted by the beautiful weather there, but we should mention that Ian and Patrick talked about much more, including settling down in Vancouver, and you can find more of their conversation on our Facebook page. Yeah, and surprise, surprise, you know, Patrick did give a few more hints today as to what could be next for him, because fans have been asking him, pestering him on Twitter to see if he'd ever come back uh, to compete in maybe another sport. He said he wouldn't rule it out, hmm. and even said he's always loved golfing and skiing. Uh, he also said he has another goal that he's always wanted to be on Dancing with the Stars, you know, which for Patrick Chan, that is easy peasy. <laughs> All of our goals, really. Yeah. Tonight's <laughs> moment is next, but first we want to show you a special moment in Boston today with the first American woman to win the marathon there in more than three decades. An incredible yes! victory, arms raised, yes! a fist pump, and Des <laughs> Linden wins the Boston <laughs> She's done it. She's been 33 long years. Oh, fantastic. Since 1985. How does it feel to finally be in the Wonder Circle? Um, I don't have the right words. Uh, I'm thrilled. It's supposed to be hard, and uh, it's good to get it done. I got my money in my pocket, a girl beside me, a little bottle rocket. There's a finger on her lips and a swagger in her hips tonight, tonight, tonight.
As the federal liberals try to convince Kinder Morgan to proceed with its pipeline expansion project, a new tactic today from Alberta Premier Rachel Notley. She's proposing new legislation that could restrict oil supply to B.C., which could drive prices up at the pump. This bill sends a clear message. We will use every tool at our disposal to defend Albertans. Notley says she doesn't see this as punishing B.C., more like keeping the pressure on its western neighbour. B.C.'s environment minister has shot back, though, saying if Alberta's actions cause gas prices in B.C. to go up, the province would consider legal action. So we've already seen some exciting moments in the NHL playoffs, tense moments on the ice, but none quite like this. Last night, when Washington's Brett Connolly spotted a young fan behind the glass at the Capitals game, he tried to toss a puck her way, not once, but three times. So we asked Keelan Moxley to give us her side of the story, and that is our moment of the day. Hi, my name is Keelan, and I got this pu puck from Brett Connolly. How did you feel last night at the Caps game when those boys got the puck and you didn't? I felt devastated, sad, but I felt good for the two boys. But I was kind of sad because I didn't get it. But um, Brad Connolly kept banging on the glass uh, at me. So how did you feel when you did finally get the puck? I felt happy. I felt really happy. And are you going to take the puck to school with you tomorrow? Definitely, yes. <laughs> That's great. And when you see her face when she doesn't get it those first two times, it, it, she really yeah. was severely devastated. She plays hockey, too, on a, on a peewee team. And she is six, going on 36, uh, says <laughs> she has no idea who those boys are and does not know that man who was behind her. But she certainly knows Brett Connolly, and she will know soon that he is a Canadian. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is funny to see how this whole story has been playing out on Twitter because you, you mentioned the, the, the dad who's, who's sort of behind them all. People on Twitter have just been ripping him to shreds, you know, asking the question, why did you hand the puck to everyone but her? Uh, I certainly don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if anyone uh, will know the answer besides him, but uh, nice to see that it all ended happily. To see her face at the end was certainly a nice thing. That is The National for this April 16th. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night. Good night.